Thank you to everyone here for being a part of this live virtual event and for those viewing this recording. As always, it's so wonderful to see so many familiar and new faces joining us. Our community is growing and I'm thankful to all of you who show your support time and time again and for sharing these programs with your friends, families, and communities. Thank you to everyone at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center, HMTC, for helping to make programs like 2G Tuesdays and Sundays with Survivors the success that they are. Andrea Bolander is here, so I got to give her a special shout out because she was my first introduction to HMTC and always made me feel so warm and welcome. I also must give a shout out to my incredible parents who have always been my best cheerleaders, teammates, coaches, and fans. They instilled in me to be the best I can, and it's because they set the bar so high that I try to be at least 1% of the mensch that they both are every day. And I have to thank all of the survivors and their families, especially Anna Sultan Eisen, for sharing your story and your father, George Sultan's testimony with us today. Welcome to 2G Tuesdays, a program that brings ch children of Holocaust survivors and their families' testimonies to people all over the world. My name is Michael Mantell. I'm a psychotherapist, educator, and 3G, a grandchild of Holocaust survivors. In 2020, during the COVID pandemic lockdown, I reached out to the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center about hosting a one-time private event for friends and family to honor my grandparents' memories. We called it Sundays with Survivors, a program that features survivors and their testimonies. Thank God the program was so successful, so I hosted a second event and a third and so on. We continued to add events and opened it to the public. And in 2021, following the success of Sundays with Survivors, we added this great program, 2G Tuesdays. These programs have featured dozens of Holocaust survivors and their family members and have reached hundreds of people all over the world and raised thousands of dollars to support the Holocaust Museum and Holocaust education. I'm so grateful that we've been going strong for almost two and a half years and counting. I've also been so fortunate to be able to contribute to the programs promoting Holocaust education. And through this work, I've been featured on a television news segment, co-wrote and contributed to articles and appeared on panels about Holocaust education and combating anti-Semitism on college campuses. I've created fundraisers that engage the com communities. And most importantly, I've made connections with survivors, their families, and this incredible community. My grandfather, Mickey Mendelovich, passed away before I was born, and my grandmother, Alice Diamond, in uh, 2012. These programs and the connections help me to connect with them, remember them, and to keep their memories alive. Today, we'll be hearing Anna Sultan Eisen's story, one that resonated with me deeply. My mother saw Anna's presentation and immediately reached out to me and said, you have to hear her story, and you need to ask her to speak on 2G Tuesdays. I reached out to Anna and she was so thoughtful and agreed. So thank you to my mom for introducing me to Anna's story and thank you Anna for being here today. Seeing Anna's presentation and reading her book, Pillar of Salt, A Daughter's Life in the Shadows of the Holocaust, I felt as though she captured my own journey discovering and uncovering my family's history. Then I read her father's memoir, The 23rd Psalm, A Holocaust Memoir, and I was transfixed I finished the book in two days. On the one hand, I couldn't put the book down. It was so captivating. On the other hand, it was so painful to read. There were so many moments that I felt my heart racing and found myself trying to catch my breath. Anna's father, George's memoir is so incredible. It's unfathomable, unfathomable, reading what he went through as a child and survived. I had to constantly painfully remind myself that this is a Holocaust survivor's testimony. Last month, the 23rd Psalm was announced as a National Jewish Book Awards finalist for the Holocaust Memoir Award. And if you read the book, you will understand why. And please read it. Anna Sultan Eisen was the founding member and the first president of the congregation Beth Israel in Colleyville, Texas. 
She has conducted extensive research into the Holocaust and spoken on the topic to schools and community groups. She served as a docent for the Dallas Memorial Center for Holocaust Studies, now the Holocaust, I'm sorry, now the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum, and conducted Holocaust sur survivor interviews for the USC Shoah Foundation. Anna is an ambassador to Every Name Counts, a digital initiative of the Arlson Archives, the world's most comprehensive archive on the victims and survivors of Nazi persecution. A licensed social worker, Anna Salton Eisen formally practiced as a therapist specializing in mental health and trauma. In this program, Anna, Holocaust author, educator, and film producer, and the daughter of two Holocaust survivors, shares a meaningful and personal perspective of the Holocaust as she recounts the testimony of her father, George Sultan's survival in 10 concentration camps and her journey back in time with him to uncover the buried secrets of the past. Along with her father, Anna co-authored his memoir, The 23rd Psalm, a Holocaust memoir, and co-authored Pillar of Salt, A Daughter's Life in the Shadow of the Holocaust with her son, Aaron Eisen. Both books are soon to be the basis of a groundbreaking documentary film, in my father's words. I'm so grateful for Anna for being with us today and for sharing her story and her father's testimony. Following the presentation, we will open up the program for Q&A. As I always say, no matter how incredible these presentations are, and they always are, the Q&A portion makes this program so much more meaningful and powerful. It's a time for all of us to interact, ask questions, and share our own experiences. So during that time, please feel free to raise your virtual hand using the hand raise emoji, or type your questions or comments into the chat for me to read for you, or unmute yourself and please share and speak. Just a few announcements before we begin. Our next Sundays with Survivors program with Henry Schachter is scheduled for this Sunday, February 26th, at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And our next 2G Tuesdays, featuring Peter Kind and his mother, Holocaust survivor Margaret Kind, is scheduled for Tuesday, March 21st at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I hope you will all join us for those upcoming programs, and please feel free, free to share the registration links with everyone you know. Additionally, I know many of you made donations when you signed up for this program, and I'd like to say thank you for your generosity. The contributions help HMTC continue to educate young people on the horrors and lessons of the Holocaust. If you still like to donate, there's always more time and you can do that after this program. I'll include a link in the chat and in our follow-up email. Also, please consider reaching out to HMTC to learn more about their community educational programs and their incredible small but mighty museum and to find out ways that you can become involved with the center, either by volunteering your time, bringing students to the museum, or bringing M uh, HMTC's Holocaust Education and Tolerance Building programs to a school near you. As a grandchild of Holocaust survivors, I am so grateful for all of the survivors and their families who share their testimonies with all of us. To organizations like HMTC that make Holocaust education a priority and their daily mission, and to friends like you who've made these programs so meaningful and successful. Your support of this program in the museum means the world to me. And with that, I thank you and I welcome Anna Sultan Eisen. Thank you um, for having me and hosting me. I wanna say how wonderful and special it is for me to be here for 2G Tuesday. Um, I live in the suburbs of Dallas and even though it's a large city, we do not have a 2G group, so it's wonderful to be um, a mother, you know, with second and third generation. I don't know if there's any survivors here, but also um, it feels like I'm being welcomed uh, back into the family. So um, I know that you'll understand and um, can appreciate uh, the sentiment I usually share with groups, and that is that when my father and his fellow prisoners um, were together toward the end of the war, they all made a solemn promise to each other that if any of them should survive, they would get out and tell the world what they had endured and what they had witnessed. And the dream was that one day good people 
without fear in their hearts would get together and learn and remember and care. And if that would happen, it would indeed be a great miracle. And so by being here tonight and listening and sharing in the story, you are now a part of that miracle. So with that, we'll go ahead and begin. Thank you. My name is Anna Salton Eisen, and I'm the daughter of two Holocaust survivors. Like many Holocaust survivors, my parents never spoke about their past, and it wasn't until I was about seven or eight that I began to realize that my family was different. We had no photographs of relatives in the house because, especially on my father's side, we had no relatives. My father never spoke of his childhood or family, and if I asked questions about his youth, he would look very sad and often just change the subject or begin speaking to my mother in a foreign language. About this time, I remember going into our den to look for a deck of playing cards. I reached my hand into a side table drawer and pulled out two stiff pieces of paper. They were watercolor paintings, vivid and frightening. I had never seen images like this in a school book or storybook, and I couldn't understand what they were or why they were in my house. The second painting was of a young man kneeling before a pit of bloodied bodies while a soldier pointed a pistol to his head. They were both signed by an L. Zaltzman, a name I didn't know. I put them back in the drawer, knowing I had found something I was not supposed to see and never spoke of them for nearly 30 years. On my own, I began searching for answers to my questions. I heard my parents mention new words like boxcars, ghettos, and camps when they thought I wasn't listening, and even went into the school library where I found a photo of a liberated camp and wondered if the piles of bodies was the secret and what had happened to my family. It wasn't until I was an adult and moved to Texas where I discovered a Holocaust museum and finally learned about the Holocaust. I became a guide there and then began interviewing Holocaust survivors on tape for a research foundation. It was then that I decided that I did not want a stranger asking my father his story, but that I wanted it to be me. I confronted my father after so many years of silence, and this was his response. I am Adam. Everyone and everything is gone, and it all starts over with me. But all I knew about my grandmother is that she died in a gas chamber, and that wasn't enough. I asked my father to share his story and to consider going back with me to Poland. In a few weeks, my family was on a plane and we were turning back time to learn what had happened to our people, our family, and to my father. We would go to the major sites in Poland, but also to the small remote towns where he had grown up and been in the ghetto. We visited the famous Camp Auschwitz where we walked along the tracks that led the boxcars into the camp where prisoners were selected to work or go to the gas chambers. I stood in this barracks where some prisoners had made a shoddy ladder and could not imagine how starving and weak prisoners could endure the bitter winters without blankets or proper clothes in these terrible places. We visited empty synagogues where cutouts of Jews in prayer served as a painful reminder of the lives and communities that were swiftly murdered. In the markets, I was stunned to see wooden figurines for sale of these murdered Jews. The features were stereotypical, and along with Jews with prayer books and musical instruments were Jews with bags of money. The old stereotypes and misconceptions were still alive and for sale. We returned to my father's hometown of Titchen. He showed us the old yellow building that had been his elementary school. We walked the neighborhoods and he showed us where his friends, like the Tuchmans, had lived. And we even went into his childhood home where the owner showed us how he was remodeling the rooms into a boarding house. I found myself standing in my grandmother's kitchen, trying to imagine her standing there with me, trying to imagine having a grandmother. Upstairs in the town hall was a closet with remnants from a few gravestones from the Jewish cemetery, which the Nazis had destroyed. There was a box of drawings from the Jewish children 
that had once lived in the town, and we were astonished to see his friend's name, the Tuchmans. We walked by the creek, deep in the woods, where his family had fled in the dark of the night to hide when the Nazis came to town to arrest and beat up the Jews. Slowly, the story of my father's life was revealed, a life of loss and sadness and suffering. And I learned that my father was the artist who painted those watercolors. My father was Luchin Zaltzman, here as a baby in one of the only photos of his family. My grandfather, Herman, a lawyer, my grandmother, Anna, my father as a baby, and his older brother, Monik. My father, later in life, began to draw some of the things he had witnessed and experienced. Here are memories of his childhood town before the war. Children playing, Jews walking to the synagogue, and a life that seemed happy and safe. But things changed on September 1st, 1939, when the Germans occupied his town. First, they arrested many of the community leaders, including my grandfather, who was arrested, beaten, and tortured in a Gestapo prison. Jews over the age of 13 were forced to wear armbands with a Star of David, and the Nazis could arrest, humiliate, or even kill Jews for no reason. Here he shows how some were forced to scrub the streets. The Nazis vandalized the synagogue and brought the Torah scrolls, which have written in them the five books of the Jewish Bible and set them on fire. And then, after two years of poverty, brutality, and misery, the Jews were ordered to take what belongings they could carry and were relocated to a nearby town where a ghetto had been established. 23,000 Jews would live in a small area without enough room, medical care, or food. It was a place of great danger and uncertainty. Daimler Benz, who makes Mercedes, had taken over a factory to make airplane engines and needed more workers. Close to 500 Jews, including my father and his brother, were chosen for this work and separated from their families. All of the other Jews were going to be sent on boxcars to farms to live in, but that was a lie. They were sent just a short distance to the Belgets death camp where they were all gassed on the same day they arrived. Thus began my father's terrible odyssey through 10 Nazi concentration camps over three years in Poland, France, and Germany. He would be one of the 465 Daimler-Benz Jews selected for Nazi slave labor. Here, the first camp he was in called Reichshof. My father was only 14, and after working labor to build the camp, he became a machinist for the Nazis. While here, his brother, who was in a different part of the camp, escaped and fled to the woods to join the resistance fighters. They promised to try and stay alive and meet after the war, and it was this promise and hope that helped my father fight to survive. At one point, the Nazis said no more Jews could be in the factory, and they were sent out on boxcars to another camp, Poishoff, made famous from the movie Schindler's List. This camp was built on the grounds of two Jewish cemeteries, and my father drew his memories of how they had to dig up the bodies using shovels and often just their bare hands. From there, they were sent to another camp, Fialichka, where my father labored in the salt mines. After a few weeks, they were again loaded onto boxcars and sent across the border from Poland into Germany. This next concentration camp was called Flossenburg, and here my father labored in the stone quarry. The work was brutal and many prisoners were killed when they no longer had the strength to do the heavy labor. In this drawing, as in many others, my father has included his prisoner number. The prisoner on the far left, bent over with a shovel, bears the number 16,019, which was my father's number in this camp. From there, they were sent into France. There was an abandoned tunnel through a mountain where the factory equipment had been brought. Inside the tunnel, someone had painted these words. 
Here worked 462 Jews from Poland, as three had died. As the Allies approached, the tunnel was destroyed, and again these Jewish prisoners were moved. Loaded onto boxcars, they would be sent back into Germany. The next camp they were sent to was Sachsenhausen. Here my father drew the memory of French resistance prisoners forced to march in a circle with a T that stands for Toad, which means death in German. At the end of the day, one would be selected to be hung. And the next day, these prisoners would march in circles again, a cruel and useless torture that went on in this camp. From there, my father and the dwindling prisoners from his group were sent to Wattenstadt. Here, the group would be split and sent to two different camps. Another prisoner named Joseph Singer pleaded with my father to change uniforms and identities so he could stay with his friends. My father did this and for a while took on the name of Joseph Singer. The prisoner who changed places with my father did not survive. My father's group went to Braunschweig while the other prisoners went to a camp called Bremen. They were next sent to a camp called Ravensbrück. This was primarily a woman's camp, but had a small subcamp for men. As the Germans were losing the war, there was no work and little food for the prisoners who began to die in large numbers. But one more time, they would be moved to the final and 10th camp. Bebelin was not even complete when they arrived. Many of the buildings had no windows or doors. And as seen here, the bunks were not completed and the prisoners just slept in straw on the mud floors. There was no work, barely any food, and the prisoners who died in great numbers were not buried, but just piled up in the yard. On the night of May 1st, they were put into the boxcars again. But after a long night, the trains did not move, and in the morning they were ordered off the trains. The Germans were shooting from the towers and the prisoners tried to run and hide. Soon it was quiet and it seemed as though the German guards were gone. It was a wondrous sight. American soldiers, a small group of seven or eight, had discovered the camp accidentally and my father and the other prisoners were free. This is a photo taken by an American soldier on that day, May 2nd, 1945. My father is the second prisoner from the right. After liberation, my father spent two years in a DP, which stands for Displaced Persons Camp. He was hoping to find his brother and also kept sending letters and messages to his only relative who had been able to go to America before the war. Here is the telegram and papers he received saying he would finally get to go to America. He sailed from Germany on September 22, 1947. Here is his photo on the ship and another small drawing he made that day to remember his voyage. In America, he was encouraged to change his name to sound more American, which he did to George Salton. He served in the US Army, met and married my mother, who was also a Holocaust survivor, and then used the GI Bill to continue his education. He went from the fifth grade, the last year he had completed in Poland, right to college, where he earned a bachelor's in physics and master's in engineering, and later had a career in the Pentagon. After our trip to Poland, I helped my father write his memoir that was just published in a 20th anniversary edition with a foreword by Michael Berenbaum, who curated the US Holocaust Museum. Michael Berenbaum wrote, we must be grateful to George Salton for writing his memoir. His work is painfully honest and we must remain open to grasp the importance of his work. With the book came amazing discoveries. We wanted to include the photo of my father at Liberation that my father had found in a book in the Pentagon War Library. The Germans had called the American parachutists those devil in baggy pants. We sent this book to our publisher and an editor there discovered that her father had been one of the seven or eight soldiers who had liberated the Vebelin camp. We flew with CNN for a family meeting 
and discovered one of the sons had the Nazi flag that his father had cut down when he liberated the camp. In my town of Colleyville, Texas, I heard about another soldier who had liberated the camp. James McGillis, called Maggie, was the most highly decorated veteran of the 82nd Airborne and is a Medal of Honor nominee. I introduced my father to him and they became friends and even traveled to the Veblen camp where they had met across the barbed wire for a special ceremony. I last saw Maggie when he turned 101 and he died when he was 103. This past September, I traveled to Arlington National Cemetery to attend his funeral and pay my last respects as my father would have done himself. Father passed away in 2016 and telling his story and honoring the liberators is part of what I have taken on as his daughter. A few years ago, I heard about the Arlson archives, which houses original Nazi documents and began a search for my father's records. Looking up his name, knowing his date of birth and town, I made many discoveries. Here, my father's name on a Robinsbrook camp list his name and number on an original list from the Flossenburg camp. And in beautiful handwriting, prisoner number 33,339, my father from the concentration camp list from France. I found a post-war card that listed all 10 camps and many of his prisoner numbers. In the first camp, he had a low number of 222 because he was one of only 465 prisoners. I discovered a hand-drawn map of the camps and ghettos where someone had run out of space because these places of terror filled nearly every corner of more than 20 countries. According to the U.S. Holocaust Museum Encyclopedia, there were more than 44,000 sites, including camps, subcamp and on an inside page of the Flossenburg report a few powerful sentences written by an American soldier if a thought may be interjected it is hoped that these volumes will prove of help to those who suffered as well as those who want to prevent a recurrence of such suffering and that it shall never in the future again be necessary to report such history I discovered the bread list from the Vebelin camp with a blank column on May 2nd, the day there was no bread, but instead freedom when the American soldiers arrived. So much history to be discovered, so much these documents tell us and how they touch us. And I learned more about what happened on that night of May 1st when the trains did not leave Vebelin. There is speculation that the tracks had been blown up by the Americans where the locomotive never arrived. What we do know is that those prisoners loaded on the boxcar were headed to Lubeck Bay. There, the prisoners from the Neuengam and the subcamps, including Vebelin, were loaded onto two ships that were mistakenly fired upon by the British aircraft and sunk, causing the death of more than 6,000 prisoners on May 3rd. My father would have been among them. My mother came to live with me a few years ago, and in my parents' home, we found an envelope with these special items. My father's post-war pass as a former concentration camp prisoner, a small calendar and diary, and a collection of photographs of his friends from the DP camps. Turning them over, I recognized the names of his friends from his town, from the ghettos and 10 camps. They were now more than names, they were real people. I went back to searching the archives to try and find some of them and made incredible discoveries. Here, a list of the 465 Hoffling prisoners, Jews from Reichshof on the way to Colmar in France near the tunnel. My father's name, third from the bottom. I went back to the Robinsbrook list and found their names, the hometowns and dates of birth of his friends. They all had Flossenburg possession cards, all blank because they had no possessions, but they had their information and signature. And then I matched them to the post-war cards indicating where they might be going. 
I started tracking them on Ancestry, Google, Facebook, and every possible way. I set out to find seven of the friends my father had spoken of, written about in his book, friends who had been with him in the ghetto, in the 10 camps, and he had been liberated with, friends who had encouraged him, shared their bread, and helped keep my father alive. And I found them all. None knew the details of their fathers who had all remained silent just as my father had. We had a reunion in person and over Zoom from Sweden, Israel, New York, Texas, and New Jersey. Fathers had shared a bond of survival, never dreaming, I'm sure, that one day their children would find each other, become friends, and share a bond of remembrance. I also found out what happened to my father's brother, who never came to America or made contact with a relative in New York. I found a record stating that Monik, son of Herman, a student from Titchen, was alive in 1946. But I also found a man who said that his brothers were with my uncle in the woods, fighting in the resistance, and that after the war, they had gone to find a Jewish baby girl who had been left with a Polish family. They did not want to give the baby up, and Monik was shot and killed by someone in that house through an open window. I also found that baby girl they went to reclaim who took my uncle's last name as her own. A few words about my mother who passed away at 100 years old. Her family fled Poland during the war and crossed into Russia. Unwilling to become Russian citizens, they were arrested and sent to Siberia. After the war, she returned to Poland and joined the Bricha, which means escape. This organization helped Holocaust survivors cross the mountains to flee Europe and collected the orphan children as seen in the bottom left photo. My mother is the woman in the top photo and also on the bottom left wearing the cape. 85% of all Jewish children in Europe were killed during the Holocaust and it was their mission to find the remaining children that the parents had meant to reclaim after the war and bring them to Israel. And so years after helping my father write his memoir, I wrote Pillar of Salt, which tells of my father's return to Poland and how the stories are passed down through the generations. Here is a favorite photo, my father and son walking through the Majdanek concentration camp, walking in step and having the conversation that my father could not have with me until my adulthood. And now my son, is helping to tell the story and produce a documentary film based on both books and my father's experiences. In January of 2022, my rabbi and friends were taken hostage at Congregation Beth Israel in Colleyville, Texas, at the synagogue that I helped start. I remember having to tell my mother what was going on. After the Holocaust, how could this terrible hatred and anti-Semitism rise up again? Will we never learn? I attended the Senate hearing of Dr. Deborah Lipstadt, U.S. envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. Why is this position even needed? How can we fight or eradicate hate, the hate that only divides us and can easily lead to violence? These are the questions for all of us. This is why we need to learn from the past. Who was my father? He was Luchin Zaltzman. I look at his photo and I look at the painting and believe that he was trying to tell his story when it was unspeakable. I see in the painting a young man in the background with a yellow star and the number 222, the same number in a star in his notebook from 1946. Under my father's name, I see he has written the name of Joseph Singer. There are important things one must not, or maybe cannot ever forget. And my grandmother, she was more than someone who died in the gas chamber. From my father's stories and her letters sent from Poland with the heavy hand of a Nazi censor, I learned that she was a strong woman who sold and traded everything she had to get food for her family. I learned that she was brave 
and pleaded with every lawyer and judge my grandfather had worked with until she found some Christians who were willing to help get my grandfather released from the Gestapo prison. And I learned that she was the most loving mother who convinced my father to stay behind in the ghetto for he didn't want to be left behind, but it might've been the only chance for him to survive. And he did. And so I'm honored to carry her name and her memory. Thank you for letting me share my story. A tour of the White House with Mrs. John F. Kennedy, created and Thank you so much, Anna. This is incredible. Um, so listening to 2G presentations, we hear testimony and and we also hear what it's like to be the child uh, of a grand uh, of a Holocaust survivor. So at this point, I want to open the the floor up for questions, comments. Uh, as I said before, these programs are incredible, these presentations, but it it adds so much more meaning when um, when folks can share. So I uh, just wanted to open up the floor. Anyone had any questions, any comments? And in the meantime, I have so many because I had time to absorb a lot of this information. As I said, I, I saw your presentation, then read the book and, and then read your, your father's memoir. Um, so um, I just wrote all my questions down, <laughs> apologize. So I'll start with, uh, you mentioned in your writings uh, and you allude in, in your presentation that when you were younger, you didn't really hear much about the Holocaust. You knew that your parents were survivors. Um, and then you did some of your own reading and research as a young person. So I'm just wondering, uh, you know, growing up, being a child of survivors and then being a, a parent to three Gs, um, both professionally and, and now, I'm sorry, personally, but now professionally dealing with Holocaust education. Um, what is your thoughts on how the Holocaust should be presented either in school or in a person's life? This is something that I'm always asked when something is age appropriate or, or how to make it age appropriate. What is the earliest and how should it be presented to, to young people? So I can speak, um, and thank you, those are great questions. I can speak as a child of survivor I'm not really, you know, um, a professional educator, but I do think personally that probably, you know, middle school and high school and beyond are the right times to introduce this, you know, along with um, an overview of World War II and, you know, the role that American played in the war. I think that when I have worked with, we worked with some French filmmakers, you know, in Europe, the countries, especially those, you know, they were all occupied, so it is a part of their history. They have memorials, they may have concentration camps, but in the United States, the American soldiers were encouraged to move on just like the survivors. And so I think we've lost that emphasis. Um, in the schools, I find that there is a lack of knowledge and understanding, and it is a lot to present, but I think that um, presenting it in this first person kind of way makes it more relatable. Um, Several states that have, you know, um, Holocaust mandates like Tennessee, you know, they emphasize telling the personal story that it shouldn't just be statistics and numbers that are hard to really comprehend and internalize. Um, in addition, I've been speaking to a lot of churches. I just was at the fifth largest church in the United States. And I find that we need to have this collaboration and relationship um, because they are and do have great influence in families, in schools. And I think we have to go to people that may not have exposure to the Holocaust and try and get them to understand this and understand, you know, what anti-Semitism is, that it's more than just, you know, graffiti or a name call. Um, and that the history of it should be, as my father said, a cautionary tale. Thank you. Um, uh, Gilda, uh, you, if you are able to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Perfectly. I, I'm a survivor. 
And I just had the opportunity, it will be two weeks to present part of my memoirs that I'm writing to a middle school here on Long Island. And it was, I had taken my, the first chapter of my memoirs and I toned it down because I was dealing with uh, fifth, uh, sixth, seventh and eighth graders. And I also didn't want to give it too long, so I did about 20 minutes worth. And when at the presentation, it's a school, there are very few Jews. I don't know how many, but not too many. And um, the teacher who asked me to do this program is a French teacher that teaches there, and she's a friend, and she knew that I was a survivor. In any event, I presented the program and it was really well received to the point that I was not, not one kid budged. They had really very few clues and then they asked me questions and answers. And it's true, many, many children, most children are not in, um, educated and they have no idea of what's going on. And I now, instead of writing my memoirs for my family, I have decided that I will do it for young adults. As a former teacher, I feel that I made such an impact on them that I think that's the route that I'm going to be taking because I said to them as my last statement, you, to, I speak to you as young people. It is your, it's your duty to go out and uh, send this message not to forget and to really promote kindness in this world because we live in such a difficult time now. And uh, so I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you so much, Gilda. Um, any other questions, comments? I know we had a few in the chat. I don't know if they were just to me or, or just to or for the group, but uh, thank you very much for sharing your and your family's story. As a child of survivors, I can definitely relate. So we have a lot of um, two Gs uh, here. So I wanna thank everyone for being here. Um, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to unmute yourself, raise your virtual hand. Uh, in the meantime, I'll, I'll ask my questions. Uh, so Anna, you also mentioned that you in your family you were one of the only researchers uh, or you know, of your family history. So um, how did that process evolve? Uh, it, it sounds like from a very young age, this this stuck with you, and you wanted you wanted to do the research. But how did it evolve to to being an educator, an author, um, and then also uh, you mentioned that your son is uh, involved right now. So, uh, what is the involvement of your family in general, and what was it like to pass the torch on to to your children, to your son? Well, I mean, I wish I could explain, even though I'm a therapist. But for some reason, I just got the bug. I, I knew my father had a lot of anguish. I knew there were things, you know, I had found a picture of my grandparents in, in his sock drawer and we never talked about it. And I think when I moved to Dallas, you know, when I was, um, you know, 25 and I discovered they had a Holocaust museum um, in the basement of the JCC and I just began to learn everything. Um, and I became a docent and, I guess it just, you know, when I was doing one of the Spielberg interviews, um, I just decided that I didn't want it to be a stranger interviewing my father. I wanted to go and ask him and, and hear it firsthand, not watch it on a tape. Um, I saw the struggles that a lot of the families had, that this may have been the first time the survivors spoke. Um, and so, I mean, I've been doing this a long time in 1977 when I was 18 and a freshman at American University, you know, the Hanafi movement took over the B'nai B'rith headquarters and held people prisoner. Uh, the former mayor, Marion Barry, was shot. Two other people died. And it was the same tropes that happened at my synagogue. The Jews have too much power, that they control the media and the press and, you know, the government. And so um, I just studied, you know, took a class in college and just, it just became something I wanted to do. Once I came back from Poland, I just felt like I couldn't, you know, it wasn't a vacation. Like, you know, I'm back and now I return to my life. And I found that 
As my father started speaking after the book was published, it changed him, it helped him um, when people would come up and say, thank you for sharing your story. And now Pillar Salt just got approved um, for schools in the state of Texas, which is um, a big step trying to bring the education. So, um, and I think my children, my son especially, you know, I took them both to Poland with my father. So I think having that experience firsthand to be with him, to hear him, to go into his childhood home, but also to see that he um, felt grateful and you know blessed to, to have a life and love, um, that they were able to understand that you could carry the pain and the memories and the story, but also still um, live a full life and you know find happiness and love in those things. Amazing. Uh... Uh, so you, you brought up a lot of things. So the the question I was going to ask a different question, but since you brought up about uh, becoming a docent, just your experience, um, I know you mentioned in your book, just um, having that realization. So I think you said like you called your father to to take this trip. Can you can you share a little bit about that moment, uh, asking him? So I'll tell you, it's a really interesting story, and I didn't put the name in the book, but you are therapists, so you might recognize it. But um, back before I went, I had a friend, I wrote about her in the book, who was, uh, had been going through breast cancer. And she had found this woman who was a therapist who was talking about you know, dealing with trauma and how to move past it. And she had groups about that. And she was going to be in Texas. And so my friend invited her to come to my house for dinner. This woman was Edith Eager who is the survivor well known now, who is the dancer who wrote the book, you know, The Choice. And she came to my house and she was a therapist at the time I wasn't. And so at one point she just said to me, you know, Anna, what question do you have for me? You know, I felt like I was shaking the eight ball and I just said, you know, should I go to Poland? And she said, yes, you must go to the abyss and learn the truth. And that very night I called my father and I said, Dad, you know, how do you feel about maybe, you know, the family going to Poland? And he said, if you want to go, we'll go. And he had miles because he had worked in the Pentagon and traveled. And in two weeks, we were on a plane. And it happened so spontaneously. Um, and it was amazing. When we were at his town, he said, I don't want to go in the house no matter what. I'm not going in the house. And then my mother started talking to this white-haired woman on the street. And the next thing you know, we're walking down the hill and she knocks on the door and we're in the house. Um, when we went to Belgitz, it was completely deserted, you know, the death camp for the Jews of Galicia. And, you know, we got there, we opened the fence, it wasn't locked and it's just was woods. This is before the new memorial. And as we were walking through, we came upon uh, a Cornishman who was leading a group that they were excavating the Belgitz camp, digging up the mass graves, um, so the trip was really so life-changing, so remarkable, so meaningful. Um, you know, it, what I got out of it surpassed whatever emotions. I mean, yes, you know, we were the tourists that were walking around crying. You know, probably anyone who might have speculated that we were Holocaust family would figure it out. But it was um, really wonderful. I encourage anyone who has the opportunity to go back you know, either with a guide or with a group, um, that it really, you can't, it's not the same experience as when you go in a museum. It's very different when you stand in the towns, when you go to the synagogues, when you see uh, what's going on, when you go to the camps. Um, it's, I think it really is life-changing for me in a positive way. It inspired me and gave me the knowledge and understanding in my heart um, of how to tell the story, you know, that what the personal tragedy and cost was to the people there. Thank you. Um, Shirley, you have your hand raised. Yeah. Hi, I'm Shirley Silverstein. I'm Hi, a Shirley. child. I'm a child of uh, parents who were survivors. And um, when you said your father went to Flossenburg, so was my dad. My dad was in Flossenburg too. And my mom was in, they were both originally from Ludge and they were in Ludge Ghetto. 
and my mom went from Ludge Ghetto into Auschwitz. Now, I was wondering, you mentioned, I mean, we, my daughter has made the family tree. She's gone to Poland. I went on the March of the Living with my daughter. I have three girls and they all know about it. Um, I actually was different than you. My parents, more my mother spoke about it. And I was five and all my friends had grandparents and I asked my mom, why don't I? So that's how I found out about it. Anyway, what I wanted to know uh, was, uh, first of all, you mentioned you got information about the different camps from a particular uh, place, not the Mormons and not uh, the other places, but uh, I didn't write it down. Could you put it into the chat so I have the name? Yes, I put it in, it's the Arlson Archives. Uh, they're in Bad Arlson. And if you go to the website, um, arlsonarchives.org or com, I'll look it up. You can fill out, you can search on your own, just put right. in a name. Um, right. records will come up, but even better is to ask them to do a search. I did a search on my father and there's seven documents. When I asked them to do it, it didn't take that long, maybe a month or two, and they sent me 69 pages. So not only do they <laughs> yeah. send you the list from Flossenburg, but they send you, sometimes it is the first page or the cover page that right. will have column headings at the top. So that's very important information. Um, some people have gotten photographs and you can oh, wow. look up in the archives by names, camps, by towns, um, any subject. You can even put in photograph, the word photograph, and it, you will find a lot. And what this Every Name Counts initiative is, is that they're trying to digitize millions <clears throat> of records. They work with Yad Vashem. Um, right. They had a day last year with Yad Vashem that it was all post-war cards in English. Um, now they just had a challenge in a week to do 30,000 documents all from Stuttgart. But they have a new platform <laughs> that's coming up. Dachau is one of the camps now you can log on and help with. And it's kind of like filling out a credit card form next to a record. Um, but the new platform is gonna have an English option. And so what we're trying to do is bring this into schools and communities, not just because it's a great teaching tool. When you type Jacob, a baker, you know, the son was eight, but also it helps them because if you can imagine, there might be a list with 30,000 names. Right. It might take a long time. Uh, most of the stuff that we do or that's online are individual prisoner cards. They did a lot of that kind of stuff that were like, um, index cards shape or size. And so it's, um, you don't have to register or give them your information. You can just log on when you have free time and, and start helping put the records so that if someone puts in Silverstein, all of a sudden, you know, 200 records will, will come up and then you can look at it by town or first name or date of birth. So it's really, um, changing our ability to understand and grasp and, you know, get access to these family histories. And there's a lot of people looking. I mean, there were Silversteins, I think, in my father's town. And it's funny because I'm not an Eisen. That was my father's, my husband's name. But there were Eisens in the 465. My cousin fact, is an Eisen. Yes. And there were <laughs> Eisens in, in this 465 were people from Lodge, from Radom from college, from all different communities. Um, and you can maybe find out not just about your family, but that maybe there was cousins or brothers or right. other people who may have perished. So um, it's a it's an important tool for us. Yes, what is, thank you very what, much. What is the e website? It is the Arlson Archives. I'll look at the spell that. that? I'm that happy to put that in the uh, the email, the follow up email. I'm also going to put Anna's uh, the the books Please. in there. Those Please, books because I, mean, yeah. I I have very little information about my father's family, and uh, I, I would like to find out about it. <clears throat> yeah, it is Arlson. I can type it in here, but you can put it in. It is Arlson archivesorg 
uh, Anna, do you know where uh, your husband's family's from? Because like I said, my cousin, my first cousin, their last name is Eisen too, and it's not a very common name. You know what? There were quite a few. My husband's, the Eisen side was in America. His, his mother's side was from Poland. But I'm saying that um, even my mother, who was from Tomasz Lubelski, had an Eisen that was married into her family. So it is much more of a common name than- Oh, really? You look at the record. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And some might have been shortened. I mean, I don't know that Eisen was, yeah. I think it was always Eisen, but um, they're on the list from my father's 10 camps. There are two brothers that were Eisens. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, my maiden name is Gutheiner. So that's not a very common name either. <laughs> No, well, my maiden name so. right. yeah. was Miller. <laughs> Very hard to find it. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Uh, Barbara? Hi, um, I'm a child of two survivors who, who left Poland and went into the Soviet Union and were sent to labor camps in Siberia. And that's how they uh, survived. But you just mentioned Kalish, which is where my mother, I believe, was born and my father was from Ludge. So are you saying that if I go to that website, that uh, A-R-O-L-S-E-N website, that I would just type in their names or type in the, the, the town? How would that you work? Could, you could, well, you could do either. But if you go in and it, there's a long box and it says the search and you put in the name, of your family, I put in Luchin Zaltzman, and then I click yes, you know, search, and then it comes up, and then mm -hmm. you can click on the records individually. But my mother also went from Tomasz Lubelski to Siberia, but I know that one of the seven names of the people I found, Yitzhak Vox, was with my father in the ten camps, and he was also from college. And in my father's memoir, he talks about the people from college. Many were. Um, left there. Some, you know, people would flee their towns and try and head east to try and outrun the Germans. So they may have ended up in Zeshov, in Shemish. These towns were all toward the east in Lublin. Um, Lubet and so they were caught up and ended up in the Zeshov ghetto um, with my father. And that's how people from college were with them in the ghetto and some in the 10 camps with the Daimler Benz labor group. So uh, people, wherever they were from, they may have ended up in a completely right. different ghetto well, depending on where, where they went and where they were sent. I'm, a, I'm a, um, a docent and I volunteer at the Holocaust Center in Long Island. Um, I'm now in Florida, but I'm, I'm up north for, for most of the winter, of summer and uh, fall and spring. And um, I talk a lot to students on video conferencing and tell them, I have a PowerPoint and tell them the story of my parents' survival. The one part that my mother never shared was what, what made them go to Uzbekistan in 1943 when they were freed. I understand they were freed. I'm sure they were not given too many choices as to where to be relocated. So they went to Uzbekistan and that's where I was born. And um, they just never talked about how well, they got mother, there. They, they weren't free till the war ended in 45. And then she mm -hmm. went back to Poland. Um, mm -hmm. They went to, she went to Chechen where she was uh, recruited into the Bricha. And so mm -hmm. I didn't even know that much about it. She didn't really talk about it either. I didn't even know my parents' real names until I was an adult. And just a few months ago, I started researching the Bricha and went to Ghetto Fighter's house in Habrika, and there's all these photos of my mother. Wow. Uh, and so, and then I found a collection of 13 or 16 photos that my parents had given to the US Holocaust Museum when I was a child. So it's wow. just now unearthing these stories. I have photos of her with Yitzhak Zuckerman, Antik Zuckerman, you know, who led the Warsaw Uprising um, with a lot of the people that came from Israel, from Palestine, you know, from the kibbutz to try and help these survivors prepare uh, for life in Israel and also to help them cross the borders and get to the illegal ships to take them. 
When we left um, Uzbekistan when I was about eight months old, and I believe they were transported illegally by the Bricha, and they went back to Lodz. And yeah. since there was no reason to stay in Lodz because there was nothing left, and the, uh, the Poles were very anti-Semitic at that point. And so they were sent to a DP camp run by the United States. And that's where we went. And it was in Germany. Ironically. Yeah, my mother was working with the Bricha in Poland. And then the local Polish police got wind of her because her mm. job was to, she would bring the new group of children and they'd get food cards or adults. And then when they left, you were supposed to return them. And so the next day when those adults and children left, to go through the woods and a new group came, she went and would get more food ration cards and never returned them. So at some point they came looking for her. So the Bricha put her on a train to Germany. And so she worked with the Bricha in Czechoslovakia, in Italy, you know, she was blonde. And so, and spoke, you know, German, Polish, Russian, French. Yep. So she was with them for um, two years doing this work. But I didn't know about it until right. just recently. So she didn't want to talk about it. I think she even had concerns that if the United States would find out, you know, she came on false papers mm -hmm. without the real birth date, without the real name, that somehow she would, you know, get in trouble. And I thought she was born in, you know, 27. And it was just about five years <clears throat> ago or six years, I learned she was actually born in 22. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she was here, she was living alone in Florida you know, at the age of 98. Um, so then she came to live with me and just passed away when she was 100 this past summer. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing all this information. I really mm -hmm. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me and for what you all do and share. And um, I put up my website. And also if anyone, you know, is interested, um, I'm happy to share my presentation with any churches schools. What I do with a lot of schools is just come on for even a 10 minute Zoom. And um, if they've read the book or watched the presentation and the, the PowerPoint is, you know, temporary until we have a film coming out. Um, uh, hopefully this summer, we have a whole third generation uh, team of filmmakers, artists, uh, original music score. And so uh, we're, we're excited to try and bring the message to the next generations in a very hopefully visually and engaging and captivating way. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Um, it is all right if we take just a few more questions, is that all right? Sure, yeah. absolutely. Um, I think uh, Esther, and then I think my mom might have a question. So let, let's go with Esther first and then we'll go with Lori. Oh, we can't hear you, Esther. I'm sorry. Let me uh, let's see if that works. Um, yeah, I live in the Bay Area in California, and there are just not a whole lot of second generation groups there. So I'm really happy to connect with this one. Um, my Both of my parents were survivors from Poland. Um, I was born in Germany. They met and married in the DP camp. And then I was born actually 18 months after my mother was liberated from Bergen-Belsen full term on her due date, you know, which is most people miscarry. Anyway, um, and, uh, you know, so yes, there's a lot and I don't want to take a lot of time, but I'm curious. Um, I've been pursuing Polish citizenship since before the pandemic. And um, because my parents who met and married in the DP camp and had a religious ceremony there, but also had the foresight to have a civil ceremony in Stuttgart. The civil ceremony in Stuttgart is what makes it possible for me to even pursue the Polish citizenship because the uh, DP camp religious one didn't count according to Polish government. Um, and I'm curious as to whether other people are pursuing um, citizenship uh, in Poland and other places. Also, I just wanted to say my father's hometown was Kelsa, which is famous for having the pogrom in 1946. Uh, when some survivors went back and he didn't go back because my mother who ran the show wouldn't let him. So smart, smart move on your mom's part. Um, no. <laughs> I, I, I don't know people 
um, who are pursuing Polish citizenship. I do follow some people on social media who are scholars and authors and find that, you know, what's going on with the laws in Poland, at one time criminal, then it was changed to be civil, that you cannot disparage or say that they were collaborating. Uh, even I heard Michael Berenbaum recently speak. I had a conversation with him and he wouldn't be specific, but he alluded to that, you know, even some future projects might be placed on hold because the Polish government is really wanting to, you know, be seen as victims and not collaborators. Hmm. And that right now there is a, a big trial going on um, and that it's really not very welcoming toward people who um, want to, you know, explore this part of history that is, that is difficult for, for Poles. And, you know, we never yeah. use the property. Um, I know the people in the town. I've been back there. Even the mayor has read Pillar of Salt. I have a picture of him reading it. But um, I, you know, my grandfather, who was a lawyer, you know, made arrangements with someone to take the house. I don't know if it was to keep it or not, but I think that's a big concern people have. That if you try and go back and reclaim property, um, it will be you will not be welcome. So yeah, I I figure Ukraine what's going on there right now has slowed down also the citizenship process which was already slow right <laughs> well i'm I, I interested to hear how it turns out for you i think uh uh it it's an interesting thing to pursue thank, thank you. you for your presentation thank you and uh laurel my mom <laughs> i think i'll have to ask you to unmute I can help by uh, clicking on mute here on this end. All right, well, mm -hmm. there you go. Oh, okay. Anna, I just want to thank you so much for your presentation. I could listen to you forever, <laughs> over and over again. You're just amazing. I appreciate oh, everything God. you're doing. I'm so happy we all connected. You just are an inspiration and your message, the message, what your dad went through and those unbelievable drawings it's like to see it come alive to see what he he did how he his memory it's like it's mind-boggling i it just mind-boggling michael and i were talking about it before your dad's experience it's just i don't know it's just i don't think there's any words but thank you you're so articulate and you brought thank it you. all to life again well, and appreciate it so i love in the new edition of his book is at the end there are excerpts of his speeches and talks. Um, we went to two 82nd National 82nd Airborne Conventions and met with the unit of soldiers who liberated him. But I just think that um, there's so many third generation and going to be fourth generation that really are going to want to know this. So while you I, have the chance, yes. even though it's difficult, um, do the search on Arlson, get the records, find what you can, put it away. Because mm -hmm. I, I hear from a lot of two, I mean, three and four G and it's so painful because they say, I don't know anything and where mm -hmm. do I begin? Um, and so I think that who knows, but I know that um, for my father, at least, I'm just glad that the story didn't end with him. And, you know, that was the thing. My son was like, once Pillar of Salt was being published, um, our publisher, Mandel Villar, he was the director at Syracuse, Indiana Bloomington at Wisconsin. So he published my book, father's book 20 years ago. And him and a group of ex-university publishers all formed this Mandel Villar Press. And they have a lot of experience and interest in Holocaust. So if any of you are budding writers, just get it done. Mm -hmm. um, contact me. I'd be happy to share their information. Do not think it is beyond you to share mm -hmm. your story. There's a lot of places right now to write op-eds, to write about the Holocaust or anti-Semitism. I think we need a lot of voices. You know, there's a lot of institutions 
but I think that there are not a lot of voices that we understand first or second or third hand um, mm -hmm. what the essence of the story is, you know, the heart and soul of it. Right, right, I agree. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. A very nice son. <laughs> Thank you. Thank He's doing you. a lot of important good work and making a huge difference. So we need Wonderful. more yeah. of this, you know. There's a lot of states. I mean, I went and talked in Tennessee. There's a city called Greenville. And they, I met with principals and teachers. They don't have a synagogue and they don't have a Jew. But Amazing. four years ago, they raised money on their own. And they took 35 teenagers to Auschwitz. Wow. So I think if there is this kind of interest, you know, we have to partner with them share the stories and understand that, especially in rural communities, in the churches, I mean, I've gone to Presbyterian, I'm going to a giant Catholic church speaking right after mass, um, Methodist church. I mean, some, they quite honestly say, you know, you are the first Jewish person uh -huh. we've ever met, but they are so gracious and they are so emotional. They, they really want to hear this. They are not the enemy is here. And I think that education is going to be our key. Um, you know, when I talk about the Christians who were wonderful, who were rescuers, who convicts that took in the children, I think we have to reaffirm the possibilities, the good role models, um, and inspire them uh, rather than hold them, you know, accountable two generations later for what, as my father would say, or actually as my son said, the Holocaust was the worst of humanity, and it is now up to us to show the way of what is the best of humanity. Well, that is fantastic. It's a great way to look at it. I, I, now I feel more inspired. Thank you. That's great. I'm inspired being with all of you. I don't have a QG <laughs> group, and that's one of the reasons why my father never spoke. I mean, he was at the Pentagon, and we lived in Maryland in a suburb and we were not part of a holocaust community at all i think my parents had one or two friends um and that was it and my mother had family in new york but they had all been partisans so they will talk about it they'll say we we're in the woods we went we burned down a farm we blew up a railroad because they were activists but i think for my father and the survivors like all seven that i found none of their fathers had talked about it Wow. Uh, unfortunately, many of them died very young of cancer, pancreatic or stomach. It could have been from the, the salt mines, the stone quarry, the DDT, but they died before their children were old enough to hear the story. So, uh, I mean, one of them just said, you know, I found my father, his name, his, they, they didn't know anything. They didn't know 10 camps. So what you think is your story sometimes will turn out to be uh, someone else's story, you know. Especially in Flossenburg, there's a lot of Flossenburg records. I would be very surprised if you do not find your family's records uh, in the Flossenburg files. And those are even on Ancestry. Because Ancestry partners with the Arlson Archives. Because Arlson Archives is a small operation. And so when I went to Ancestry, I can find the list of documents and then I can go to Arlson and actually pull up the documents. So Great. And actually right now, Ancestry has started a special project for Holocaust survivors and their families. They're calling it the Holocaust Reunion Project. And they are having a whole special thing, if you go to their site or Google it, that they're trying to find you know, these Holocaust connections for families because people don't know they have Holocaust records. That it's not just, you know, great grandma from the farm in Idaho that they have those kind of records that they are accessing from the Nazi archives in Germany. That with the DNA, and there you know, you never know who you're gonna find between the records and the DNA, because Ancestry does that as well. I, I do recommend that to everyone. That's part of my journey. And that's why your book resonated with me, just this discovery of family history. We connected 
um, with family that we never knew existed. And my mom just met uh, for the first time after I think 50 years. Uh, and we saw pictures of my father's family. He, he for the first time, saw pictures, I think, of his uh, grandfather and great uh, grandpa. I mean, it was just the most remarkable thing. So definitely, it, it's incredible what's available to us today. Um, I, I did want to ask you, if I, if I may, because uh, your, your father was writing, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, drawing before he was writing. When did he start uh, drawing these pictures? Um, what was the earliest that he has uh, pictures from? So the watercolor paintings that are now part of the U.S. Holocaust Museum collection um, were done in 1946. And so, um, you know, he was 17 years old when he was liberated, 19 when he came to the United States. So those were painted with just a fifth grade education, no art training. And for his whole life, he was drawing, you know, doodling, um, doing a mosaic, whatever my mother told him to do. She was also an artist. but the Holocaust work, like for instance, what's on the book cover, you know, he was at a meeting and it was on the back of a flyer and that is his Flossenburg number. But I have a collection of uh, drawings, doodles of from the camps and it wasn't really until 2008 after the book was out that he started just drawing these stories from the camps and um, those the original set is now part of Yad Vashem. Um, but everything on my website, all the drawings are downloadable, shareable, all the Nazi documents, everything we have for no cost. Um, and that's what some teachers are interested in taking a few drawings and putting them in the classroom, using them as a prompt for writing essays or discussion. Um, and then also because, you know, in some places there's difficulty with books. So they are looking schools at new ways of teaching the Holocaust without literature for right you know and so art is another way to to tell the story without having to come up against what's going on in some schools and then when did he first start speaking publicly and when did he start this endeavor of writing a memoir so he did come visit one class i had in college. I'd never heard him speak. It was the first time at American University. And actually the professor, Richard Brightman, who taught the class, wrote a blurb on the back of um, the, my book, Pillar of Salt. But after that, he really never, he didn't speak about it. It wasn't until I helped put together a, a convention, a conference of 2G um, back in probably 1992. And there was someone from New York, California and me, and we went to DC, we met at a hotel and we're like, okay, we're 2G, what do we do? We didn't know what to do. Um, none of us had really been around other 2G. You know, the US Holocaust Museum um, was just, you know, being built. Schindler's List was just coming out. You know, our parents finally were beginning to speak and they were not gonna hand over the microphone. And so um, we met and it was after that trip when I confronted my father, because I said, you know, we can hire a researcher to go to Titchen and get records that he said, I'm Adam. It all starts over with me. Why do you want papers? Everyone is dead. And that's when I said, all I know is that she died in a gas chamber and tell it to me. So I got out a legal pad and gosh, by about the third camp when I couldn't spell, you know, Bielichka, he said, okay, give me the, give me the pen. And then what he came back with was, you know, I think on our first go rounds was 600 pages. So over a year I was in Texas, you know, he was um, by then in Florida and we would talk on the phone every day. And one thing would lead to another story and I'd be typing, wait, what happened, what happened? And then um, that's how the book came. And then he started speaking and that was really um, the most life affirming thing for him. Like I said, we went to military bases, and American young soldiers would come up and be visibly moved. And I think that he just really struck a chord with them. Even now, um, the superintendent of schools where I live, you know, I lived in Southlake that had the whole alternative view of the Holocaust argument that would receive nationwide attention. You know, he said, I remember your father coming to speak, you know, 20 years ago and my kids when they were little. So we're trying now to get the school, the books in the schools. Um, I'm an approved speaker for the state. 
which is a process. You have to be approved by the state legislature, your book. Um, there's a lot, it's a lot more controlled. So we, this will be a multi-year uh, thing trying to get the books and, you know, hopefully the film when it comes out into schools um, to find a way to, you know, keep the history going. Uh, there were so many nuggets from, from both books. Uh, one thing that you just kind of remind me of is when you spoke with your father, you asked him not just to tell you how they died, the family, but how they lived. And I think that was such a beautiful sentiment. I think so often we we think of the Holocaust. I remember, unfortunately, you know, when I when I spoke with my grandmother was always focusing on the Holocaust, on the Holocaust. And almost like as a secondary thought, um, I, I didn't get to ask about the lives, you know. And so when I read that moment in your book, it really touched me. It, it's so true. Well, when you go through towns and in the middle of nowhere, you know, I remember we went because I brought back some things that I gave to the museum, but we heard there was a Talus, you know, in this town and we went on this wild goose chase and it turned out to be a scarf. But when you go there and you see little plaques, you know, the coffee shop was the synagogue. Yeah. You know, the rabbi's house is now an art gallery and you just realize and when you walk in these former synagogues that are coffee shops or art galleries, you, you know it's a synagogue. You see in the architecture, you can tell, you can feel it. Uh, the upstairs and the downstairs with the seating. So, and there's a lot of still homes with the thatch roofs that are, you know, from then. And we, even in my father's town, there was a house with like a blue metal barricade in front and we stepped behind it. And sure enough was the marking, I have a photograph, of where the mezuzah hung with the, with the nail holes. So it just makes you realize how much life there was when you go to the cemetery in Warsaw, you know, where there's 30,000 people buried. Um, and it is a beautiful place filled with trees and birds. And you, you realize there really was, you know, a rich life that was uh, stomped out, you know, generations of, of, of lives in more than 20 countries. And I've only been to, you know, a few countries. I haven't gone to see, you know, the concentration camps and the sites in, in France um, where my father was or some of the places in Germany that are quite remote. But that's the next, uh, the next step. I've been invited to, to many of the camps to come and visit, to speak. You know, they want the descendants to come there and, and have some kind of connection. And then I, I wanted to also ask, I, I know from your experience going back to Poland with, the, with your, your parents uh, and brothers, uh, I think in the late 90s, you, you saw that anti-Semitism was, was still around. You mentioned in the presentation with these uh, caricatures, these dolls, um, and just some of the experiences that you had with the interactions with people. Your father mentioned this in his book as well. Um, and then uh, Colleyville, Texas, we've had this horrific um, hostage situation. How do we reckon with anti-Semitism from your, from your understanding and perspective as Jews and just in general? Well, I mean, I think education is key. And I think also helping people understand, you know, what is anti-Semitism? We have the new working definition that's being adopted, that it's basically, you know, Jew hatred expressed in writing physically, verbally, um, and there's plenty of examples. But I mean, I get anti-Semitic messages uh, on social media and I read about what's happening, you know, what we experienced in our synagogue. And the fact that to make people understand that even though what happened in the synagogue was a year ago, that we have an armed guard at the door, that I'm going to speak in another state where the person just wanted me to know that they got concealed carry because they consider me a target. Um, that I just went to a church, a big Presbyterian church, and they promoted it on Facebook and they got anti-Semitic messages. And they were like, what? And they had to hire police to come. And so that even though these things happen, you know, you're a therapist. I, you know, I'm a therapist. I read, you know, Judith Herman, Trauma and Recovery. You know, it's safety, process, autonomy. Those are as she outlines. And so when I explain to people, 
I don't feel safe yet, you know? So I can't really process and move on and integrate it and heal because I'm not safe yet, because these things are happening. Because I who wrote about in my book that, you know, I came back and went to a jewelry store and tried to, you know, order a Star David, which they had never sold in my little town in Texas. And now, you know, one of the former hostages, you know, shared with me an experience that he went to another town and the Uber driver was anti-Semitic and said, you know, there's no Jews here because do you see any diamond stores? There's no banks. And so, you know, we don't feel uh, quite safe. And it's, and it's getting, I think, worse, um, worse in the schools, worse on college campuses. Now we have all the tie-in with what's going on in Israel and that anti-Israel is now anti Semitism, anti-Jewish in America. Um, so what happened, you know, my son graduated from University of Virginia a year before what happened in Charlottesville. So I think that, as I say, you know, when I talked about the Holocaust in schools 15 years ago, 20, you know, it was a history lesson. Now it's current events. Now I have to talk about, you know, media and celebrities and what's going on anti-Semitism in comedy and, you know, how we normalize it. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, and I think we become more sensitive to it, which is a good thing because then we have to speak out to people and say, you know, I even went to visit a Senator and in the office, I won't say who it was, but you know, his staff was like, cause I called one of my kids and they were saying, well, oh, is that like Jewish mother's guilt? And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Right then and there, that's not appropriate to bring up my religion at all. Um, so I think, you know, it's uncomfortable to do this, but, you know, it has to be done on an individual level. And more importantly, we need cities to adopt the working definition. We need corporations not to tolerate it, uh, sports teams, you know, we need allies, but I think it's not just individuals. I think, you know, with the internet, I mean, in Germany, in the penal code, it is against the law to have a swastika or deny the Holocaust. You know, they have free speech, but not when it comes to that. And I always say, you know, I mean, if the Germans themselves are not denying that the Holocaust happened and they perpetrated it, why do we have all these people denying the Holocaust on their behalf? I mean, even the perpetrators are admitting it. So I think it doesn't make sense. And I think it ties in with all the conspiracy theories and we have our work cut out for us. But as Deborah Lipstadt said to me that day when I was with her in the Senate, if the Holocaust itself was not enough to end anti-Semitism, what will? So I think ending it is a separate dream, but you know, addressing it, I'll use that word rather than fighting it, addressing it, um, responding to it, has got to be our work. If we're not gonna do it, you cannot expect other people to do it for us. So we have to all do what we can. You know, if you're not comfortable confronting it, then you can get involved with organizations, American Jewish Committee, Anti-Defamation Leagues. You know, there, there are plenty right now um, that are putting a lot of resources toward dealing with the rising anti-Semitism. And I'm sure your museum. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll ask one last question. Um, I, I will just one more time plug that these are incredible reads. If, if you can, if you if you can get through them, it's painful, but it, it is so important. Um, and there are so many nuggets of information and just inspirational things to take from here. So just as a final note, that you might leave us on something that you or your father would would share that that would leave people. I mean, he survived such horror. Um, well, I will share, and you, you, if you read the book, you know. And even though it might make you emotional, I will say that we were gentle. My father was not one to ever speak about horrible brutality or like horrific things that are impossible to read. But he did write at the end, and he talked about how when he went to the first gathering, the gathering of the survivors, and there was about 7,000 people there. And I think he says there was maybe 2,000 survivors and 5,000 children of survivors. You know, survivors hoping to find people, which of course they didn't. But he said the fact 
that these people who have been through, lost hope, suffered so much, despaired, would have enough healing and hope to, to have children, that for my father, looking at the children of survivors to him was a mountain of hope and inspiration. And in those remarks, he says, so if there are others here who have gone through difficult times and need someone to turn to or need hope, then turn to the Holocaust survivors. Look to us, he says, look to us, because we who have suffered have found a way to still believe in life and find hope again. One time he was invited to a huge synagogue in Florida for Kol Nidre to speak about hope. And, and he had a sense of, of humor. He tried to be gentle. So if everyone was silent and the room was heavy and he started by saying, I was invited here to speak about hope. And let me say, I have lived with hope and without and with is better. So I leave you with that to keep hope no matter what you face in your lives. And we, we're all there for each other. And I hope if any of you are in Texas, you will drop me a line and I'll, I'll have you for a meal. So Beautiful. thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you everyone for being here and being a part of this program. Take care, be well. Thank you. Bye-bye.